Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Fortress Power in Northern Arizona Wind and Sun webinar. Please note that a copy of this presentation, as well as a video of the webinar, will be sent to everyone tomorrow. If you have any questions, please type it in the questions tab in your menu, and we will be answering these questions at the end of the presentation. Our presenters for today are Alex LaCour, West Coast Sales Manager for Fortress Power, and Therese Umholtz and James Hall of Northern Arizona Wind and Sun. We will begin with Therese. Please go ahead. Okay, well, thanks so much for attending today. We're excited to have you here. Uh, so I'm Therese and I um, handle the dealer and installer program here at Northern Arizona Wind and Sun. Uh, if you don't know us, we are a solar design center and solar equipment distributor based in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, we've been in business since the 1970s. Um, and we are uh, actively growing our dealer network now, uh, both to help customers uh, who need installers, um, as well as um, offer wholesale pricing to um, to help those those dealers and installers with their um, their businesses. Um, we're super happy to introduce the Fortress battery storage solutions into our product line back in the first quarter of 2020, I believe. Um, they totally took off and um, initially we were just, uh, you know, shipping them, at, you know, according to order, but now we're stocking the Evolt and the Eflex and they sell great and we've been extremely happy with the feedback that we've gotten on them. We also um, you know, test them and and install them in our own uh, de uh, demo systems. Um, so so yeah, I mean, we're just happy to to have a solid product and happy to share some more information with um, with you guys about it. Thank you, James. I think is next. Yeah, hi. So my name is James. I'm one of the application engineers here at Northern Arizona Wind and Sun. I'm also the sales manager. Um, our sales team is extremely experienced in lithium battery integration and uh, experienced with off-grid applications and grid tie um, ESS solutions. So we're here to help you with the overall system design from the ground up, integration and compatibility uh, for a variety of different products, inverters, and lithium battery compatibility. And uh, we offer unprecedented technical support um, from start to finish with your project and beyond. So um, if you have a project or a retrofit application uh, that you want to use a Fortress battery in, um, give us a call and we can put a Fortress battery solution together for you. Great, thanks James, thanks Therese. I wanna take this moment and thank uh, Northern Arizona Wind and Sun for hosting this wonderful webinar today. For those that don't know me, my name is Alex Lepore. I'm the sales manager over here at Fortress Power. A uh, little quick uh, agenda for what we're gonna dive into today. We're gonna to talk a little about Fortress Power, um, who we are and what we do as a lithium battery provider. We'll then jump into some different applications that you can use our batteries for. And then we'll dump, jump into some different sizing tips and tricks that we recommend here, um, not only with Fortress batteries, but for batteries in general. So that being said, I'm gonna jump right into who we are and what we do. So like I mentioned, we're a battery provider based outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a focus on the residential and small commercial project applications. We're headquartered in Southampton, PA, which is 30 minutes northwest of the city of Philadelphia. And we were founded back in 2016 and were owned by a group of investment bankers and solar veterans. You can see here on the right, this picture, this is our warehouse. It's a 30,000 square foot facility. This is where we do a lot of the R&D sales and logistics. And then we do have two other warehouses in California and Florida. Batteries being a hot topic nowadays, we've done installations not only in the continent, continental US, but also in Canada, the Central Caribbean, South America, Europe, and Africa. And we're also the exclusive lithium battery supplier for SEPTA, which is our local railway company outside of Philadelphia here, and Hydro-Quebec, which is a Canadian utility company using our eFlex for some very interesting applications up in Canada. So that being said, uh, we do have some different battery options. I'll jump into the next slide. But 
First and foremost, you can use batteries for many different applications on the market. I know traditionally it was just for backing up your facility, right? Powering your facility when the grid goes off and keeping the solar panels running during outages. As per the NEC code, without batteries, if the grid goes off, your solar stops producing. So furthermore, not only can you do this for backing up your facility, but you can use batteries in a self-supply application. So you can use PV and batteries where the grid is prohibiting feedback. We're seeing this in, in states like Arizona and Hawaii, where they're restricting the use of net metering. And then you will also be able, or the customer in this case, can maximize their PV production to store any excess production from their solar array into the battery and then discharge that battery for particular loads, let's say in the evening or even at night. You can save money on your electric bill with batteries. So you can ch um, charge them during off peak times and then discharge them during peak times. This is called time of use application. So for example, in places like California, where they'll maybe charge 20 cents a kW from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., they might charge 30, 40, 50, or even 60 cents a kW during those peak times. So what people can do is charge their battery during those off-peak times, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and discharge it for particular loads during those peak times to help save and get a better ROI on your battery system. And like all batteries, they are eligible for the 26% IPC tax credit when hooked up with solar. And there's many new state and utility rebates that are being um, either rolled out as of now or have been available. Um, first one that comes to mind is the S-CHIP incentive in California. There's also the GMP rebate program that's in Vermont. So depending on where you're located, reach out to your local utility. See if there's local rebate programs for solar and storage because they can certainly help with your project cost. Now, that being said, we have definitely seen in the past five years alone a tremendous growth of battery storage. And according to Department of Energy analysis that was recently um, released, by 2030, stationary deployments are going to exceed 150 gigawatt hours. Wow, that's a lot of storage. This is being that we have 27% annual growth for grid-related storage applications. So grid-related storage applications um, or stationary storage appli uh, applications in this case refers to energy storage for homes and businesses. So if you check out this graph here on the right published by the Department of Energy, you see here in 2021, we're probably on like 10 or 15 gigawatt hours. And then by the end of this decade, they're expecting over 150 gigawatt hours of stationary development. So storage is certainly a hot topic now, but by the end of this decade, it's going to be going gangbusters. And the largest market for energy storage is going to be North America at 41.1 gigawatt hours. So adding storage to your business model, adding storage to your home, this is the perfect time to do that, to take advantage of all the new incentives like the 26 ITC or take advantage of the newest de developments in technology, right? And you might be asking, why has this growth or why are they projecting this growth by the end of this decade? The first thing is the battery affordability. So if you think for the last five or 10 years, we've seen the cost of solar fall over 20%. Now batteries is gonna have a similar trend. And by 2029, they're gonna see 46% price reduction in the actual lithium battery cells. This meaning that if a battery is $10,000 now, that by the end of this decade, it might be $5,000. Now that being said, it may make sense for that person to wait to get a battery system, but I always say the sooner you get the battery, the more you can collect on your, on your ROI for your battery system. So the sooner really is the better, especially with solar and solar batteries. The second thing that why we're seeing a lot of uh, storage growth is the rising incentives. So as we all hopefully know, the 26% federal ITC tax credit was extended till 2022, which is great news. And then there are also a lot of statewide incentives that I mentioned, like the SGIP incentive, the GMP incentive, and other statewide rebate programs. Now, these programs, you might have to reach out, like I said, to your individual utility company, because they might give programs on the size of the battery, the size of the solar. So there is a really good website I'd recommend. It's called Desire, D-S-I-R-E dot org, Desire. And it can show you per state what kind of incentives are in your state for solar and storage, so you can see if you can take advantage of that. And the last thing is this shifting mindset. So 
The first thing here is fear. And as we all know from that terrible situation in Texas that took place a few weeks ago, power is more important than it's ever been. People are scared that they're either paying too much for their electricity, they're gonna lose power and not have an option to keep their little ones or their family protected. So batteries are really becoming really, really popular because of fear of the unknown, fear of not having power, what be you? Now there is this high emphasis on renewables. We're now seeing the effects of climate change starting to come full circle. I say this because a once in every 500 year storm is no longer a once in every 500 year storm. It's more like once, even twice a year in some instances. So this high emphasis on renewables to think clean, to have a recyclable lithium iron phosphate battery that's longer lasting is certainly the objective for most homeowners and businesses at the same time. And then the last thing is the newest political administration change is certainly playing a part in the growth of batteries and solar, as well as just awareness that batteries and solar are a very, not only tangible, but realistic and smart investment moving forward. You think 15 years ago, I'm sure the political administrations then didn't think that way, but now we're coming into this, this awareness era where people are learning more, they're more educated than ever to make good decisions for their homes. So that being said, we are approved with many different financing partners, um, as I know that buying a battery can be quite expensive, depending on what battery you get. So some financing partners you can reach out to are LoanPal, Sunlight Financial, Enerbank USA, and Lightstream. So depending on what kind of financing program you're interested in for your solar and solar battery, you can reach out to any one of these four of our financing partners, and they can certainly get you in the right direction. Always like to bring this up in the beginning so people know you don't always have to do cash out of hand for batteries. There are financing programs available. So that being said, let's jump into the meat and potatoes of this presentation here with our battery options. So we have here on the left our Evolt 18.5. And then on the right here, we have the little sibling of the Evolt, our newest product, the eFlex 5.4. The 18.5 is 18.5 kilowatt hours of total capacity. And we've had this product released for around two years, maybe one and a half years as of now. Some key features of this product is that being its larger size, it's very easy to install. You're not paralleling multiple smaller batteries together. And it can stack up to 12 for 200 kilowatt hours. This one does have the UL1642 approval in terms of listings. So it does have the certification for the cells themselves in the battery. And we are testing this right now for UL9540, which I'll be diving into the next, I think like two or three slides or so. If we look at the LCD display that we saw in this previous slide on the E-Vault, this is a really neat feature that the end user can see essentially right into their battery and see how it's performing. So you can see on the LCD display, the voltage of the battery, the current, the current state of charge, and then the power output in KW. You'll see here it has a master-slave relationship in the M set. So if you had one battery as the master and you had six in parallel, the rest would be slaves. And then it shows you the parallel number here, how many batteries are in parallel. So if we had six, this parallel number would be six. What's really neat about this LCD display is that it has a neat safety feature on the right-hand side here in these circles. So for example, let's say there's a low voltage sensor going off in the battery, this light will light up. This is really important in terms of just technical support and diagnosing problems, because you can see firsthand what the first and foremost problem is by seeing which one has lit up, whether it's an open circuit, high temperature, high voltage, et cetera, et cetera. It's gotten a lot of really neat feedback, really good feedback on this LCD display in, re in regards to the EVOT 18.5. Now, moving forward, we do have the little sibling to the Evolt 18.5 is the E-Flex 5.4. It's our newest product. We're really excited about this because of all the really, really cool features it has. So the BMS in this is a uh, contactor-based or relay-based BMS, which allows you to have closed-loop data communication with different inverters that we're working with. So as of now, we have Solar, Schneider, and Outback confirmed with the closed-loop communication. Closed loop communication in a nutshell is essentially the inverter and the battery talking with one another in a seamless fashion. There's no manually inputting parameters. 
It's very easy. It really makes for a nice plug and play solution. And the E-Flex, because of the BMS in the battery, has this functionality. It also have remote monitoring of each battery pack and then single cell management and monitoring. The E-Flex has a cell to pack architecture and comes with an IP65 rated aluminum enclosure, making it weather resistant and indoor or outdoor rated. Being lithium iron phosphate, it comes with an integrated heatsink for five times better thermal performance for those indoor outdoor projects. And in some instances, it can support a supercharge feature of 45 minutes. I always like to say, although this is certainly a possibility on this supercharge feature, we don't recommend that you do it you know, often. Uh, usually I recommend it that for emergencies, like medical equipment emergencies or emergencies of that kind is where the supercharged feature can be a really neat um, addition to whatever kind of project you're quoting out. Now, it is a little corny, but the E-Flex is extremely flexible. So it was designed for many different applications like home energy storage or RV applications, telecommunication applications, computer server power backup applications, and railway applications. And it can be used in indoor or outdoor, like I mentioned, and can be put on the wall, on the floor with T-slots and hung up on the wall in case the footprint is small, let's say inside or outside um, where or near the inverter is. And then it also can be fit into a 24 inch standard server rack um, where you could put let's say three or four in a rack to then parallel racks together. This unit, the E-Flex is stackable up to 15 units for 80 kilowatt hours. So the E-Vault, larger battery, stackable up to 12 for 200 kilowatt hours, which is why we say that's smaller commercial space. Then we have the E-Flex, the flexible unit, stackable up to 80 kilowatt hours, but has the closed communication and the indoor outdoor capability. So we do have these two options, depending on what your project calls for, you can use one or the other to fulfill your customer's requirements. Now that being said, I did mention the E-Vault has UL1642 and the E-Flex has UL1973 and UL9540. UL1642, quick overview, is the cells themselves in the battery. 1973 is the entire battery pack being UL listed. And then 9540 is the complete system testing in relation to rated output power and AC unit for the inverter and that battery. So the E-Flex has the closed loop compatibility with the Solark, Outback, and Schneider, like I mentioned, with this UL9540 listing of the inverter and battery being tested together. There are some limitations to be aware of in regards to UL9540 about the max rated power being 27 kW and the maximum battery capacity being 1,260 amp hours, which pencils out to roughly 60 kilowatt hours. Testing for UL9540 is extremely strenuous as it includes full charging and discharging at the highest rated power of the inverter and battery, high temperature tests to see if the temperature gets high in the battery, how does the BMS respond and function in that kind of scenario, and then overrated power. So for example, meaning a 9kW inverter versus a 12 kW inverter, how does it respond with different currents coming from larger versus smaller inverters? It is a very strenuous test. It usually takes um, quite a while as the testing with an inverter and battery has to be done separately and then obviously together. So a little sneak peek on 9540, there's a lot of really good information on the UL website regarding 9540, <clears throat> excuse me, that I would recommend you guys checking out if there are more questions on this listing moving forward. So that being said, here are some of the technical specifications of the batteries I A4 mentioned here. Um, we'll go over <clears throat> every single one of these, but the first thing I wanna point out is that all of our batteries are 48 volts. So lithium iron phosphate at 48 volts, and you can see here the EVOL can stack up to 12 for 200, the E-Flex can stack up to 15 for 80, and then the communication here for both of them is with CAN or RS485. The warranty on our batteries is 10 years and outside of the US is five years. We do have an extended warranty option. Please connect with your local rep if you're outside of the US to learn more about the extended warranty option of our products. So moving forward, there are a lot of different battery chemistries on the market. You have lithium iron phosphate, you have lithium ion, there's lead acid batteries, there's gel batteries. So I wanted to break down 
the different batteries on the market and why lithium iron phosphate is really becoming the gold standard moving forward. So we see here, I set up a quick comparison chart of the lithium iron phosphate that Fortress Power uses. We have lithium ion, otherwise known as NMC, nickel magnesium cobalt. This is the chemistry that Tesla or LG Chem uses. And then we have the lithium polymer or LiPo. This is similar to the battery in your phone. The reason why I think LFP is really becoming the gold standard for batteries is due to its safety and longevity. So I'm sure we've all seen the press about the Tesla batteries, lithium ion batteries experiencing thermal runaway. The great thing with lithium iron phosphate, because of the uh, removal of the cobalt in this chemistry is that it's extremely safe and it's also eco-friendly and can be recycled. I mentioned uh, usually if you want to recycle your battery, there's a company called Battery Recyclers of America. They have three EPA rated facilities throughout the US that can recycle lithium iron phosphate batteries. So this can be recycled at the end of its lifespan, let's say after the 10 year warranty's up. It's very thermally stable and has much longer life cycles, 6,000 cycles versus around 3,000 cycles of the lithium ion, then 6,000 versus 1,500 to the lithium polymer. Now, if you see here, the LFP is less energy dense than the NMC or lithium polymer. But in terms of stationary energy storage, it really makes sense to have a safe, long lasting battery that can put out a lot of cycles to fulfill the loads in that person's home. Now, for the lithium ion battery, it certainly makes sense, for example, with Tesla's car, right? They need a very dense battery that can be cycled to move the car from point A to point B. So, that's not to say that different chemistries can work for different applications, different projects, but in terms of home energy storage, this is why a lot of companies are now transitioning over to lithium iron phosphate because of those things I had mentioned before, before including the energy density of it. And one thing I like to pass along, if you want to see um, me walk the talk, they say, as the safest um, battery chemistry on the market, check out this video we have here. When you do get the slideshow, you can click right on this link. And essentially what they do is they have two videos. They have lithium iron phosphate cell here, and then an NMC cell here. So the LFP cell, essentially they drive a 10, 10 inch nail right through the center of the cell. And you'll see throughout the video, there is some smoking. Um, there is some smoking that kind of takes place, but nothing too, let's say catastrophic. Now, they do the same thing over here with the NMC cell, lithium cobalt that Tesla uses. And you can see here it goes full on apocalyptic as soon as this 10 penny inch nail goes through this cell. So you can really drill a net now. Full disclaimer, do not drill nails through your lithium battery cells, but theoretically you could do it and there would not be um, quite the reaction you see here on the right hand side with lithium cobalt. So this will be um, obviously, obviously available when you get the slides, Probably it's a four minute video or so. You're welcome to check it out. Really good tool to show other people about the safety standard of LFP. I did mention the eFlex has a contactor based or relay based battery management system. Generally, the battery management system is the brain inside of the battery. There are two kinds of battery management systems you have the MOSFET based BMS, and then a contactor based, otherwise known as a relay based BMS. So a MOSFET-based BMS protects against overcharging and deep discharging, OCPD, um, short circuit and open circuit protection, which is certainly a really good thing to have when you have lithium batteries. With our Evolt and Eflex, we chose to take it a step further with this contactor-based BMS, otherwise known as a solid state relay battery management system. So it has all the protections that a MOSFET-based BMS has, but it also has the communication between units in parallel, the remote monitoring features that we will have um, being rolled out in the next couple uh, months or so. So it's really in terms of um, having the safety standard as well as the communication. This contactor-based BMS in terms of the E-Flex allows it to do closed communication with those inverters I had mentioned before. And like I said, the e is still testing. So if you need an immediate solution with closed communication, the E-Flex is certainly the way to go. And then the LFP 10 and 5, the older units we have, I had not mentioned, then they use a cylindrical cell, which is your common cylinder cell that fits into the battery. We use prismatic cells in the E-Vault and E-Flex. Now, why is this? 
the prismatic cells, they're shaped like a rectangle. So in terms of volume and space, you can fit more of the prismatic cells in the same amount of area versus cylindrical cells. The prismatic cells are also more robust. They can handle more current, more efficiently, and they're a little bit longer lasting than the cylindrical cells. Now, that being said, not one battery can fit all the applications out there. So in some instances, a cylindrical cell and a MOSFET-based BMS will work just fine. But for maybe some larger projects as solar arrays um, on average get larger, the inverters become larger, the prismatic cells with this contactor-based BMS is a really safe way to go to protect the battery and more importantly, the battery cells at the end of the day. And then, like I said, I want to go over a design guide for PV and storage. I get a lot of questions on, well, how do I size a battery? Why is battery sizing important? What can I do to get in the right direction to make sure I'm sizing my battery? Now, the folks over at Northern Arizona Wind and Sun do a fantastic job of sizing different batteries for different battery projects. And I would certainly recommend them as a great resource if you do have sizing questions, either um, during your project, before your project, or if you're just curious. So what we want to figure out first is, is this an AC or DC coupled solution even before you start sizing up your battery? The reason why I say this is because an AC coupled solution is when you're retrofitting to an existing PV system. So this is for new installations that require a module level rapid shutdown. So if it's an AC coupled solution, you might be tying this on with an existing PV grid tied inverter to then a hybrid inverter and then our battery. And then you have here the applications for DC coupled solutions. So this is for new installations where there's no additional PV inverter. And obviously because of the um, extra materials here in the AC coupled solutions, the DC coupled solutions are a little bit more efficient for battery based projects. So first figure out, am I doing an AC coupled solution or am I doing a DC coupled solution? That's gonna be really important to figure out what materials you'll need, what's on site as is, and then what steps you might need to take next, depending on what direction your project's headed. So here's a list of our compatible inverters that we're working with. And we always recommend here at Fortress to size your battery for double the size of the inverter that you're using. So for simplicity's sake, let's say we're using the Solar 12KW. We would recommend here at Fortress that you use around a 24 kilowatt hour battery, although you could use one Solark in the Evolt 18.5 as a turnkey package. But general rule of thumb is you want it to be doubled. So for example, Schneider has a 6.8 um, 48 inverter. You would want the battery to be around, let's say 13 kilowatt hours. So you'll see here with the asterisks here, we have closed communication with some of these inverters you'll see here like Schneider, Outback, and Solar. And we're currently doing testing to establish the closed communication with the two stars, the Victron inverter and the SMA inverter series. So first determine upon what inverter are you gonna be using and then how are you gonna set it up? Are you using this in closed communication? Are you AC or, AC or DC coupling this? Are you gonna use it in open loop communication? That is your first start. Figure out what inverter am I using and basically what general battery size will I be using as a start. Remember, you can always add more batteries on within one full year of the installation. So the end user doesn't have to feel like, okay, I'm getting one battery now and I'm stuck. That's not the case at all. They could start with one, get two, three, four, and then up to 12, let's say, up to Evolt if they really wanted to go in that direction. So we do have a sizing tool that's available for our authorized installers. Uh, more information can be found on our website, but general sizing guidance, let's assume this is for an emergency power application. You select the loads to be moved from the main panel to the backup panel, calculate the daily usage of said backup load panel, select the appropriate battery bank size for that usage here in number two, and then you can estimate the daily available power after your battery is sized. Sizing is critical and taking these four steps is very important because let's say you're using an emergency power application and you undersize the battery. Then you're over promising and under delivering with what your battery is going to be providing to the electrical loads in your customer's home. And if you oversize the battery, then there might be problems with too, lo too long of charging times. Imagine a hose with a bucket. You have a small hose with three big buckets that charging time isn't going to be charging um, as maybe recommended from us, the manufacturer, if you had properly sized 
the battery in this emergency power application. And the same thing for like a time of use application. If the battery is undersized for time of use, they won't return their full ROI on the battery for that project. And then the same thing with oversizing. So we do have a lot of really good resources that you can check out when you get the slides. Like on our web page, we have a good resources in terms of proper sizing that can be found on our warranty letter, letter as a start. Check out our YouTube channel. You'll see yours truly going through how to install, um, how to sell the battery. We have our applications engineers go through sizing batteries for different applications. Energy Sage has a really nice sizing tool you guys can check out here. And then Energy Toolbase has a good sizing tool, typically for larger projects or commercial projects. But I would easily pass along any one of these four as a good start for sizing um, in terms of sizing resources. So you'll see here on the bottom, we have some quick case study pictures. Uh, you see here the Solark with some E-flexes here in a rack, the Solark with some more E-flexes here um, in a wall mount situation. We have some E-flexes just hung on the wall here, two e vaults can't tell what inverter that is, but two E-Vaults hooked up here. And then we have, looks like eight E-Vaults here with the Schneider series. So like I said, E-Flex, really flexible with installation, E-Vault, easy installation, most bang for your buck. So before you choose, there are seven characteristics of lithium in general that can affect your, affect your system behavior. So before you either drop in lithium because of a lead acid replacement or you're creating a whole new lithium job, these seven key um, facts are really important to know. The first thing, the battery management system. One of the most important, if not, if not the most important factor, knowing what kind of battery management system is, is in the battery. Is it a MOSFET based? Is it a contactor based? Next, you wanna know about the voltage range. So less fluctuation or traveling between low and high state of charge. And this would require more data monitoring to measure that state of charge. Cold temperature charging, cold temperatures do have a uh, more adverse effect to lithium batteries than warm temperatures. So that's why you'll see that in cold conditions, we recommend keeping that battery within our recommended temperature range. This is anywhere from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 113 degrees Fahrenheit, um, respectively. The full discharging, we recommend an 80% depth of discharge for 6,000 cycles. Now, full discharging, 100% every time is obviously going to affect your life cycles more than doing an 80% depth of discharge. Now, that being said, if you're using our battery, let's say in an emergency power application, maybe you can do a 90% depth of discharge to get the maximum battery power because they won't be cycling it every day since they're only using it during outages. So typically, do you recommend the 80% DOD for 6,000 cycles, meaning that if you cycled it one time a day, it would last anywhere from 12 to 15 years. Next thing we want to look at is the uh, discharging or charging rate, the C rate of the batteries. Typically, it's 0.5 C. I have seen some batteries in 1 C. Uh, the more energy dense the battery, it means faster charging and quick charging. So a lot of these batteries, depending on the C rate, means you can either charge and discharge that battery faster or slower. Different batteries have different C rates. Important to check before you invest in your battery. And then last but not least, the higher upfront cost. So obviously, but in comparison to lead acid, lithium's upfront cost is a little bit higher, but you are gonna get longer life cycles. Lithium is maintenance free, and you are gonna get more bang for your buck. Over the course of time, you can expect your lithium to be operational versus a lead acid battery. So seven characteristics, you're welcome to review this um, when you do get the slides as these are all very important to know for your project before dropping your lithium in. So that being said, I wanted to open the floor up for a quick Q&A. Uh, Northern Arizona Wind and Sun is also online here to help answer questions. And you can find all of our contact information here for yours truly with my direct line, Therese, and her direct line over here. And then any other sales questions can be referred to our sales email, technical support questions, and any warranty questions or submittals can go over to warranty at fortresspower.com. So that being said, let's open the floor and let's see how we can help. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. The first one is from Dave. Uh, he's asking, do you install in Northern California? 
So as the battery manufacturer, we don't do any installations. We just make the batteries, but we do have a lot of installers in Northern California. So my recommendation would be shoot over a message to sales at fortresspower.com with your project, what you're looking to do and where you're based. And then one of the reps here at Fortress can get you plugged in with a Fortress Power authorized installer to take the next steps with you on your project. And yeah, just uh, piping in for us, we don't do installations either. Um, you know, we're just a distributor, design house, but we also maintain a list of um, installers in the area. And we do tend to have quite a few in California because we're based in Arizona. So um, you'd be welcome to, to uh, send an email to me and I'd be happy to share those names with you as well. Great. Okay, uh, Drew asked one more question. He said, recently in Massachusetts, a code official has been requiring additional drywall, fireproofing, and other costly additions for storage in garages. Does your unit avoid this? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think depending on the jurisdiction that you're located in, the phosphate chemistry, I think, can make inspectors feel at ease because of the safety of the chemistry. Now, I can say that you know we have something for that where it can avoid adding extra drywall because truthfully I do not know. Um, but it could be something when you talk with the inspector, letting them know you know this is not a cobalt-based battery. This is a phosphate-based battery. It's a completely different animal to what they might be expecting or um, what they're expecting to be installed. In this case, it would be a cobalt-based battery. Okay. I mean, I can add as well. So, like generally. The authority having jurisdiction is the authority, judge, and jury. Like, you know, if they're going to make you do something, then you're going to probably have to do it unless you want to argue why you shouldn't have to do it. And educating the authority having jurisdiction can be kind of a pain in the, a pain in the butt sometimes. So, you know, that's on you. But um, the uh, UL 9540 will also help with that because it, um, you know, it defines various safety considerations um, in testing. So it could help as well, but the authority having jurisdiction is also ultimately gonna define what you need to do unless you wanna argue with them. Well said, James. Okay. Um, okay, next question is, what are the temperature requirements for these units? Mm -hmm. I think most battery providers will recommend you keep it in the 32 degree Fahrenheit range to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, how compatible is the 5.4 with the XW Pro, i.e. BMS? BMS. So the Flex does have the closed communication with the Schneider system. Um, so it will work rather flawlessly. We would recommend in terms of sizing at least that you check out our warranty letter to make sure that you're sizing the proper amount of e-flexes to the Schneider inverter, whether like the XW6848 uh, or even the XW Pro. So it will work well and it has the closed communication, but certainly refer to our resources tab to make sure that you're properly sizing X e-flexes to the Schneider system you have you either proposing or installing or whatnot. Okay, uh, Alex, Luis is asking if we can have the second to last page back. Second to last page. This one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, do you know if there are any rebates going on right now in California? Yeah, the first one that comes to mind is the S-SHIP rebate, otherwise known as the Self-Generation Incentive Program. Um, the This program is throughout all of California. It pays anywhere from $850 a kilowatt hour to $1,000 a kilowatt hour, um, depending on if you qualify in the equity rebate or the equity resilience rebate. That's probably the one that I've heard of the most because um, there are some instances where people are getting batteries for free registering with this SGIP rebate. So in terms of California, that's probably the most popular as of now. And it's the one I've heard about the most. Okay. Uh, another question coming in. Also, in case, real oh, quick, ahead, sorry. If, you, if you go to Desire, Desire, the you had a link to that, right, Alex? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that there you can search your particular location for any other um, local, state, or federal incentives. Right. Thank you. Um, in case of power outages, do your batteries have built-in protection, or would the 
user have to purchase additional device for protection? Mm -hmm. And that is the function of the battery management system. So like I said, I'm going to fly back a few slides here, everybody. So hold on to your seats. Um, uh, where'd it go? This one. So the battery management system is the safety feature of the battery. So it will prevent the battery from overcharging and deep discharging, overheating, low temperature protection, OCPD, um, and the short circuit and open circuit protection. So that will already come in the battery in the battery management system. Okay, uh, Dave has a question. Can we place the E-Vault outside? Will it handle rain, hot weather where the temperature touches 120 degrees Fahrenheit? The E-Vault is strictly an indoor rated version. Um, now that being said, I have seen some interesting applications where they get a, an enclosure to put the evolve outside. Now, depending on where you're located, um, that enclosure will have to fit appropriately to your location, whether it's hot or warm temperatures. There's a good enclosure company, James, you probably know a little bit more on this than I do, but Hoffman Enclosures makes a good enclosure that you could probably roll the evolve into for these outdoor installations. But typically, the e is just an indoor rated battery. You want it to be outdoors, you need an enclosure. Uh, NEMA 3R is preferred, um, as that's gonna have the greatest resistance to moisture, uh, rain, dust, things like that. Yeah, we can, we, can custom, we can get custom design enclosures to fit however many you know, batteries you want, inverter equipment, whatnot. But yeah, generally it needs to be a NEMA 3R rated enclosure and thermally controlled as well. So if you're, you know, reaching 120 degrees, being that the battery's limitation is 113 degrees Fahrenheit, then you might have to consider, you know, some sort of thermal um, considerations because the battery itself is also going to create heat. So it's going to compound with the ambient temperature. And so you just need to bear in mind there. But yeah, the E-Flex is better for outdoor applications. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question here. What is the downside of integrating the E-Flex with an inverter in open loop? Hmm. I wouldn't say there's a particular downside. Like I don't, I don't think of a, a like a con, let's say, for setting it up in open loop. I think closed loop just makes it just a lot easier. There's more communication between the inverter and battery. You can certainly set it up in open loop. But the inverter and battery are only going to communicate via the, I think it's the voltage or state of charge of that battery. With closed loop, it really becomes a fully integrated system. So there's no like con per se to open loop, um, but closed loop just has that next level of communication um, between the inverter and battery. Okay, next question. For getting maximum life of 6,000 cycles, what is the minimum charge hand minimum? Repeat that, Jamie, sorry. For getting the maximum life of 6,000 cycles, what is maximum charge hand minimum? I'm not sure what they mean by this question. In terms of the recommended charging and discharging rates, um, we would just recommend that you set it up according to what we have in our parameters in terms of like uh, amperage and charging and discharging. A lot of the life cycle will come on the depth of discharge side. Um, so, for example, if you have 100% of a battery, you use 80% of that, meaning you charge it up to 90, and then you just charge it down to 10. So it's not really a function of the actual charging and discharging and amperage, but more on the depth of the total depth of discharge of that particular battery. Okay. Does the BMS prevent dead start condition? That's a really good question. Um, I do not know. Uh, James, do you happen to know? If not, I can certainly find out and then reach back out to you. What do you mean by dead start? What does it mean? What, what, are, they, what are they referring to? The inverter itself? The battery being completely dead? What? Uh, Jeremy, let me know in the comment section if you have an explanation. Yeah, let's touch back. I just want to know what he yeah. means by the dead start specifically so we can address that question. Right. Sure. Um, Dave is asking, can Evolt be wall mounted? So not hung up on a wall. Um, the Evolt is 470 pounds, so it can't be placed up on the wall like the E-Flex. However, if you're in a jurisdiction, let's say that requires it for seismic activity, there will be L brackets that you can get and put on the back of the Evolt and then connect it to the wall to fulfill those requirements. So you can't 
mount it up on the wall um, like knee flex, but you can mount it rolled up to like a back wall, use your L bracket and then attach it to the wall that way, but just not up in the air. Okay, uh, so the dead start condition means completely dead battery. So uh, you BMS should be able to restart the, so if the BMS goes into a low voltage shutdown, uh, initially when recognized, um, no, uh, relatively soon, uh, you can restart the BMS and restart your inverter system, get the system charged back up. It'll fail safe uh, by turning off the entire system, opening the contactor within the BMS, uh, within the battery itself, or all the batteries, and then you can uh, reinitiate the system uh, by resetting the battery and um, start the system back up and get the system charged. Will this work off grid as well, with no grid, no generator? Of course, yeah. We okay. we always do we do systems grid tie off grid with batteries. Um, that's our specialty. So if you if you have any particular application that you want to do a system for that's off grid, we can absolutely help you with that. Great. Jeremy, I hope that answers your question. And I don't have any further questions, so I'm going to give it one more minute if anybody has any additional questions they would like to ask the team here. Well, Dave, uh, Dave is asking who he can reach to get a quote to install a battery in California. Yeah, I would say again, just um, feel free to email me. My email is right there, Teresa at solar-electric.com, and I would go. Uh, I can go through our installer database and send you some contact names and phone numbers. Perfect. Um, Carlos is asking, does the eFlex come with a wall mount kit? So, really good question. It will come with a fuller mount kit that it will be put on the floor. The wall mount kits are extra. Um, as like an extra accessory. So it does not come with a wall mount kit, but the friendly folks over in Northern Arizona, Wind and Sun can certainly add one onto your order should you need it. Yeah, we, we have them in stock. Mm -hmm. Very common. Okay. I believe that is all we have for today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, again, this presentation will be emailed to everyone who attended the webinar and a recording of this webinar will also be shared in the link and you should get both of those things tomorrow from us and james Teresa, i want to thank both of you for hosting this webinar with us we all hope uh, you found it helpful and informative regarding energy storage in general including fortress power thank you thank you thank you guys thanks, thanks for attending all thank right. you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.